Mr. President, members of the court, good morning. It is an honor for me to appear before you on behalf of the Republic of the Gambia. You have already heard from my colleagues about the genocidal acts that have been committed against the Rohingya by Myanmar up to and through the presentation of the United Nations fact-finding mission of report of 16 September 2019. It is my role to address the situation of the approximately 600,000 Rohingya who remain in Myanmar today. Their situation is one of extreme vulnerability with ongoing acts of genocide against them and the grave risk that even more heinous atrocities a new clearance operation, or worse, will be inflicted upon them at any time. As the independent fact finders have made clear, the evidence of Myanmar's genocidal intentions has actually strengthened over the past year. In the words of the distinguished Nobel laureate Toni Morrison, who passed away just a few months ago, let us be reminded that before there is a final solution, there must be a first solution, a second one, and even a third. The move toward a final solution is not a jump. It takes one step, then another, then another. I will therefore draw your attention to the steps Myanmar is taking currently that reflect its continuing intention to destroy the Rohingya as a group. Each of these steps has been reported by the highly credible, independent, and eminent investigators acting under the authority of the United Nations, intergovernmental organizations, and human rights organizations. Each of these steps heightens the Rohingya's vulnerability, points towards further acts of genocide, and foretells the risk of more violations of the Genocide Convention. The first step is the forceful segregation and confinement of 20% of the Rohingya in internment camps and ghettos, where they are in situations of extreme precariousness. As the UN fact-finding mission reported, Myanmar forcibly transferred over 120,000 Rohingya men women and children into displacement camps outside Sitwe town in central Rakhine state in June 2012. For over seven years now, Myanmar has cordoned them off from the outside world with barbed wire, police checkpoints, and military posts, restricted their movements, subjected them to physical and mental abuse, and maintained them in a state of fear for their survival. They remain in that state, easy targets for the next wave of mass killings, especially as they are guarded by the same Tatmadaw that carried out the clearance operations. Myanmar claims its confinement of the Rohingya in their displacement camps is for their own good. It claims this is necessary to ensure the protection of the communities from intercommunal violence between the ethnic Rakhine and the Rohingya. But as the UN fact-finding mission report points out, Myanmar has not shown how any actual risks justify this extreme and indefinite restriction of movement. At times, Myanmar has simply denied that there are any restrictions on the interned Rohingya population. Yet, as the UN fact-finding mission observed, the existence of the restrictions on the movement of the displaced population is undeniable. It is attested by the checkpoints and signboards at the entry of the camps, the barbed wires, the experience of those trying to leave the camps, and the simple fact that over 120,000 people have not been able to go back to their place of origin despite their desire to do so. Myanmar has confined a separate group of Rohingya in the Aung Mingala quarter of Sitwe town. The UN fact-finding mission explained that this quarter is effectively a closed ghetto where Muslims are trapped and have lived separately from the rest of the population since 2012. It is guarded by armed 
police, checkpoints, and barbed wire, the Tat Madao maintains a small presence in the school grounds. People can only leave the quarter with special permission and in organized convoys with police escorts. The remaining 80% of the Rohingya reside in villages under close watch by the Tatmadaw. The UN fact-finding mission's September 2018 report explained that these Rohingya are required to, tra to obtain travel permits to leave their villages, and they're generally not permitted to travel to ethnic Rakhine areas, including the main towns and markets. The September 2019 report indicated that the restrictions have increased in severity over the past year. It noted that the government currently restricts the freedom of movement of Rohingya through a combination of local orders, verbal instructions, security checkpoints, soldiers and patrols, which have the cumulative effect of confining them to their villages and camps. The UN fact-finding mission has concluded that this state-mandated segregation fosters a conducive environment for dehumanization and hate campaigns. Yet, Myanmar is building more internment camps for those Rohingya who have not yet been interned. Refugees arriving in Bangladesh informed the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that the Tatmadaw is forcing men and children as young as 12 years of age to perform unpaid work on 12-hour shifts to build houses in camp-like facilities in different locations in northern Rakhine State. According to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, one interviewee stated, the inhabitants of, inhabitants of his village, which was largely untouched by the violence of 2017, were informed by the village administrator that they would be removed from their homes to a newly constructed camp. Other interviewees described the camps as closed areas with only one entry gate, surrounded by barbed wire and watchtowers. Yet another interviewee expressed fears that the camps had been built with the objective of forcing the Rohingya to live in miserable conditions with the eventual intention of exterminating them. Mr. President, the extermination of the Rohingya who have been rounded up into internment camps and closely guarded ghettos and villages can come swiftly at any time in the form of new clearance operations perpetrated by security forces who are stationed there. Or it can occur in slow motion through denying them food and other essentials of life. The UN fact-finding mission in its most recent report found that while the former method of destruction could be resumed at any time, the latter method is already in progress. The government has severely restricted access to food for Rohingya in Rakhine State, and the resulting food insecurity is being caused by government laws and policies. Article 2C of the Gen Genocide Convention identifies deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about a group's physical destruction in whole or in part as a genocidal act. Myanmar is implementing its policy of denying food to the Rohingya by various means, including its widespread confiscation of agricultural lands on which the Rohingya grew crops, essential to their survival. The UN fact-finding mission determined that Myanmar is undertaking a concerted effort to confiscate these lands. The ongoing confiscations extend beyond the Rohingya villages that Myanmar destroyed during the clearance operations. Rohingya-owned and cultivated land has now been confiscated in areas of northern Rakhine state where Rohingya remained. Members of the Rohingya group are no longer allowed to consume products from their own lands following the confiscation. The UN fact-finding mission explained that the Tatmadaw is also depriving the Rohingya of food by deliberately killing or confiscating their livestock without permission or payment. One interviewee who fled Butidang Township explained how this was conducted in his case. 
Military, police, members of ethnic Rakhine constantly came to the village and looted everything, including food items. The military, military took away my seven cows that I was grassing in the hillside. I cultivated rice in my land. When it was ready for harvesting, members of ethnic, ethnic Rakhine snatched the harvest. I was left with nothing except two goats, which I had to offer to the military for my release. As the UN Special Rapporteur reported based on the evidence it found, there appears to be a policy of forced starvation in place, designed to make life in northern Rakhine unsustainable for the Rohingya who remain there. The Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women made the very same determination earlier this year. <coughs> Mr. President, a further step Myanmar is taking against the Rohingya as a group is the intensified effort to force them to accept national verification cards that explicitly recognize cardholders as non-citizens and brand them as Bengalis. While the Rohingya are loath to accept the national verification cards, which erode their right to the identity, without them, they are denied access to essential life-saving and life-supporting foods and goods and services. The UN fact-finding mission has found that all of these steps, the manner in which the government deprives Rohingya of land, the manner in which the government imposes movement restrictions and deprivation of food, and the manner in which the government denies the Rohingya their identity and deprives them of the rights people need to survive and live with dignity are ongoing and support a conclusion that the government continues to harbor genocidal intent and that the Rohingya remain under serious risk of genocide. As the UN fact-finding mission concluded just two months ago, the Rohingya remain the target of a government attack aimed at erasing their identity and removing them from Myanmar. And this has caused them great suffering. The laws, policies and practices that formed the basis of the government's persecution against the Rohingya have been maintained their plight can only be considered as having deteriorated. Similarly, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar stated just two weeks ago, the system of oppression the Rohingya are subjected to remains unchanged and they are at real risk of recurring genocide. Mr. President, if the Rohingya are to be protected against further acts of genocide, it will be up to the court to order the provisional measures that are necessary for their protection. There is no other alternative. Certainly, Myanmar cannot be counted on to protect them from itself. In the past few years, it has appointed numerous commissions to investigate the genocidal acts that have been reported by the UN fact-finding mission and other international observers. None of Myanmar's commissions have found any violations of internationally protected rights. As the UN Commissioner for Human Rights concluded earlier this year, the establishment of commissions of inquiry has become routine after cyclical episodes of violence in Myanmar, with eight such commissions having been established since 2012. None of the previous commissions has led to the prosecution of any Tatmadaw official. All have been exonerated. Likewise, the UN fact-finding mission concluded in September of this year, Myanmar is not meeting its obligations under the Genocide Convention to conduct an independent criminal investigation into allegations of genocide. The mission draws this conclusion based on the government's pattern of ignoring compelling evidence that genocide took place on its territory and its failure to put in place investigative mechanisms that are independent, prompt, thorough, effective, credible, and transparent. Typical of Myanmar's own investigative mechanisms is its advisory board for the Committee for Recommendations on Rakhine State. It is one of a very few that included international members. Among them, was Ambassador Bill Richardson, a former U.S. representative to the United Nations. 
he resigned after the first round of meetings, denouncing the board's so-called investigation as a whitewash. Kopsak Trutikul, a Thai diplomat who served as the board's secretary, quit soon thereafter, expressing his concern that the board's existence was going to divert attention from the issues, give a false impression that things are being done. Instead, he said, Myanmar government officials did no more than defend the line that this is an internal matter. We are handling it. We haven't done anything wrong. This is a false narrative. Mr. President, it is Myanmar's narrative that is false. It is also reprehensible. This is what the chairperson of a state-level investigative committee said about the widespread and well-documented rape of Rohingya women. He said it was inconceivable because they are very dirty. The Bengali Rohingya women have a very low standard of living and poor hygiene. They are not attractive, so neither the local Buddhist men nor the soldiers are interested in, in them. The chairperson of Myanmar's investigative committee was not the only one to categorically deny that Tatmadaw soldiers have raped Rohingya women. What you see now before you and at tab 18 of your judges folders is a current screenshot from the Facebook page of Myanmar's agent in these proceedings. As you can see, the Facebook page insisting fake rape, fake rape, belongs to the Myanmar State Councilor Office. Mr. President, members of the court, in the Gambia's view, Myanmar's false narratives like these and its sham investigations further demonstrate the need for you to order provisional measures to compel it to live up to its obligations under the Genocide Convention during the pendency of these proceedings to protect the Rohingya from recurring acts of genocide. Next, my colleagues will show how each of the requirements for provisional measures set out in Article 41 of the Court Statute is fully satisfied, and they will describe the specific provisional measures that are called for in these exigent circumstances. I thank you for your kind attention and ask that you call next to the podium after the break, if you are so disposed, Mr. Arsalan Suleiman, who will address the court on its prima facie jurisdiction over the Gambia's claims. <laughs>